Thank you for tuning in. This is Pastor Peter Vitello, Good News Bible Church. Looking at a message I've titled, In the Midst of the Storm, taken out of Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 48. Father, bless your word as we look into it, as we dissect it. I thank you, Father, that you give us clarity. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us to open our understanding. Feed us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter six, verse 45 through 48 says this, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. This is a story about wind, an event about wind and rain and struggle. You could say, as you look at this, it's also a story about the storms of life. Try as you may, deny it if you want. But change it, you cannot. There are and will be storms in life. By storms, I mean trials, tragedy, loss, heartbreak, pain, and at times excruciating agony. Life may be full of uncertainties, but there is one thing that is certain, the storms of life. Sometimes the storms of life take place because of our own doing. You can say that we've become, in a way, our own weather makers. It's about bad choices. It's about consequences of those choices, having to live with what follows those choices, such as certain lifestyle choices or drugs or alcohol or ungodly pleasure practices or lifestyle pursuits. It can be the consequences of lying, gossip, hatred, jealousy, anger, idolatry, lust, or apathy. But there are other storms of life brought about by the decisions or the sins that are committed against us. There are storms also such as wars that affect nations and at times the whole world. Then there are still other storms of life, really weather related, like ice storms and snowstorms and earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes. Then there's famines and pestilence and worldwide pandemics such as what we are experiencing right now. Put these all together and you have the storms of life. There are also storms that take place that just don't make any sense at all. As a disciple of Christ, you've given your life to Jesus. You've accepted and believed in salvation through the gift of his son. And you may be doing his will, everything in your power to love him and to serve him and to love others to live a life worthy of the calling, and yet storms come into your life that do not seem fair, and they make no sense at all. So here are the disciples, and they are experiencing something that they are familiar with, except for one thing. It must have been pretty puzzling. Jesus is the one who made them get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. Therefore, Obeying the commands and the will of the Lord should be a, a prosperous and a very healthy thing to do. Why the storm? It makes no sense. And like the disciples that day, we say, I don't like this. I don't want to go through this. This is not right. It's not fair. I want out of this situation. This is probably what the disciples were feeling on this particular day out on the Sea of Galilee doing the will of God. One of the first things we see in this story is that the disciples were straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Those are powerful words that reveal what life can be like at times. When the wind is in your face, when you strain and you row and you row and you get nowhere, you're at a standstill. In fact, the wind sometimes is so strong you're driven back. The trial is so hard to bear that you're pushed back. The reality for some people is it like the disciples at this point, they may even be in a fight for survival. 
For the disciples of Jesus, though, one of the hardest things about this particular storm is that the Lord, the Most High, the Ancient of Days, the all-powerful King of Kings and Lord of Lords, creator of the heavens and the earth, could just say the word and the storm would stop. No more winds, no more rain. The waves would be still. At his word, there could be healing. At his word, the marriage would not dissolve into dis divorce. At his word, the prodigal would return. At his word, all could be well. What's tough is many disciples know that the Lord can do anything and everything. But the storm rages on. The winds and the rain are still coming. And all they can do is strain with the oars for the wind is against them. Question for you. What is a disciple of Jesus to do in situations like this? Lamentations chapter 3 verse 26. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The prophet Jeremiah is not talking about the salvation of the soul. He is talking about deliverance from a certain situation. John Kerr says, There is the salvation which a man needs in any crisis of life, where he suffers under trial or is threatened with it. And in these trials, hope and quiet waiting do not come at once into their fullest exercise. As long as humans, as long as human means can avail, it is a man's duty, trusting to divine help to employ them. To sit and wait where effort can avail is to insult God's providence. The salvation of the Lord is when all conceivable means have been employed and have failed. There are times when a person has done all they can do about a certain situation and they can do no more. That is when they must import hope. When the Israelites had reached the Red Sea, they were hemmed in by the mountains on either side of them and the charging Egyptian army closing in from behind. And then straight ahead was the sea. There was only one thing they could do at that time, and Moses made that known to the people that day. Exodus 14, 13 says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he has accomplished for you today. The truth is, you do not have an Egyptian army pursuing you. But for some of you, the reality of the storm you are experiencing is every bit as real. You may feel that you're hemmed in on both sides and the trial is upon you. And the sea is before you and there's nowhere to turn to and no one to turn to. No one really understands or even really deeply cares. And you may feel that you are about to go under for the last time. Now, I know that there are times that the Lord chooses to let us strain at the oars. And we can experience the Lord in ways that we might never have experienced him if we did not go through that particular situation. Yet, if you're like me, most times, in fact, 99% of the time, I don't want to go through the experience. I'd rather lead a quiet, comfortable, easy, shallow Christian walk. Yet, this is a very selfish, self-absorbed, self-preservation attitude. As much as we do not want to admit this, because of the storms of life, we do experience the Lord. And he does manifest himself to us in much deeper ways. You see, faith, hope, and salvation are all combined in the midst of the storms of life. They work together to bring us to spiritual maturity. Faith is the attitude of the soul. Hope is the experience which that attitude creates in regard to the future. The ministry of hope is discovered in the very conditions that cause despair. Paul said to the church at Rome in his letter, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? 
But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. All you have to do is watch the news and you realize just how chaotic and unstable the world is right now. Without hope in the Lord, without trusting that he is in control of the storms of life, it can be a horrible, lonely, despairing time in which people strain with the oars for the wind is against them. The most awful feeling in the world today is to have absolutely no hope for a future. A believer doesn't have to buy into that school of thought. And this brings us to our first point this morning. Number one, on your outline, even when you do not feel God's presence because of the storms of life, he sees and intercedes for you. Let me say that again. Even when you do not feel God's presence because of the storm of life or storms of life, he sees and intercedes for you. We go back to our text, Mark chapter 6, verse 48a, And it says, then he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Then he saw them. Just because you can't see the Lord or feel his presence in the midst of the storms of life, especially your personal storm, it does not mean that he's not there. That is what the enemy wants you to believe. And just as Jesus was on the mountaintop praying and watches his disciples, he's on another mountaintop. And he's watching and he's praying for his followers. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 7. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the utmost utmost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Paul said again in his letter to the Romans, it is... Roman Christians, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He's praying for us. He's interceding to the Father. So Paul says, so who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because he's at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us. Why? Because his spirit lives within us. The person, third person of the Trinity, lives within you. That's a double barrel shotgun. Listen to this. Number two, even when the storms of life obscure your spiritual view, the Lord is with you. Mark continues. He says, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. You think? Here you are fighting for survival. You think you're going you're gonna to drown. The boat's going to get swamped. And all of a sudden, you see some person walking on the water. Listen to this. Again, even when the storms of life obscure your spiritual view, the Lord is with you. To Abraham, the Lord said, I will be with you and bless you. To Jacob, the Lord said, I will be with you. To Joshua, twice the Lord said, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Again, he says, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. To Gideon, the Lord said, surely I will be with you. To Solomon, the Lord said, I will be with you. To the the Israelites, the Lord continually said, I will be with you. Notice that Jesus left the mountaintop. And not only did he leave the mountaintop, he went directly into the midst of the storm that he told them to go into. 
Jesus goes through the storms of life with us. Listen again, John chapter 14, 15 through 18. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. That is why we have so much confusion right now. That is why there's so much hate right now. Because he's the spirit of truth, the third person of the Trinity. And the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you and will be within you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. You And Jesus did it in the midst of the storm and he sends the Holy Spirit and he does it every storm we go through. And the person of the Holy Spirit, he is with us. Number three, even when you do not know how to pray or what actions to take, the Lord will speak to you. Again, even when you do not know how to pray, or what actions to take, the Lord will speak to you. So here's Jesus, he's walking on the water, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves, beyond measure, and marveled. You see, when I don't know what to say to Jesus, I let him speak to me through his word. And when I listen, he'll speak words of encouragement, words of comfort, words of life, because he is the word of life. And he still speaks today because of this all-powerful truth that man cannot deny, change, or destroy. And that truth is this, letter A, the Bible speaks. The Bible speaks. Peter in his second letter says this, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns with the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks because it is the word of God. Psalm 119, 160 says, the entirety of your word is truth. John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus prayed to the Father that he would sanctify us, which means to set us apart, to cleanse us, to make us holy. We talked about that last week. By his truth. And then Jesus stated how that would be done through his word. As he prayed, he said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. He still speaks. You see, when you are in the midst of the storms of life, when the clouds of care are driven by the winds of worry, and the rage of the rains come, and the waters rise over their banks and come against you with an overwhelming torrent, and when your emotions are filled with frustration and anger and despair and fear, and it seems like you can't take it anymore, know that the Lord is with you and know that the Lord will speak to you and he will bring you through that storm. Or better yet, he'll cause it to cease. In Psalm 56, 4, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. Letter B, surviving the storms of life depends on what you believe because convictions rise or fall based on their truth. Let me say that again. This is pretty powerful. On your outline, letter B, surviving the storms of life depends on what you believe because convictions rise or fall based on their truth. And what I know, I speak to you with clarity and with conviction. The Bible speaks and the Bible is truth. Jesus said this, 
Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock. Or founded on the rock. Notice what Jesus said in this parable concerning life. Storms are inevitable. They happen and will happen. If you've been building your life on the rock, on Jesus and his teachings, his salvation, his love, his promises, are that you will weather the storms of life. These are convictions based on truth, biblical absolute truth. The teachings of Jesus are not man-made nor powerless. They are truth because Jesus is truth. And promises based in truth are always fulfilled. If he said, I will be with you, he's with you. If, he'll, if he says, I will speak to you, then he speaks to you. John Kerr again says, it is from heaven and not from earth that a believing man expects the outcome of the sun. You find therefore that his eyes look upward and when it cannot see God, it seeks the place where he is hidden as a flower bends its head toward the cloud that veils the light. There is a salvation of the Lord which lies beyond the above, every deliverance in the power or even the conception of man. You may be saying, Peter, I just, you don't understand what I'm going through. I may not. But I do know this. My Lord said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Jesus and, and Luke is recorded as saying, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, uh, perplexity and, and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. If you're a disciple of Jesus, and you are experiencing the storms of life, make sure that you do not surrender to spiritual amnesia. You must remember who you are and to whom you belong. John 1, chapter 12, I mean, uh, John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You are a child of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And by faith, you've been grafted into the promises of God. You are an adopted child and a co-heir with royalty, heavenly royalty. You are a blood-bought child of God. And God has never and will never forsake those who call upon his name. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. When things get crazy and life seems out of control, when evil seems like it reigns over the land, when the storms of life begin to blow and you find yourself straining and rowing for the wind is against you, remember his word, import his word, trust his word, because not only does the Bible speak, it cannot fail. Psalm 12, verse six, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The NIV says it this way, the words of the Lord are flawless. The Revised Standard Version says, the promises of the Lord are promises that are pure. There are times in which we must look back to when God, by his amazing grace, adopted us as his children. We must remember who we are and to whom we belong. Spiritual remembrance of God's word and our past commitment of placing our faith, our hope, and our trust in his word defines our present state and our future inheritance. Another verse that speaks to us from scripture that the Lord speaks to us when we are going through the storms of life. Listen to this, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
There's a story that Stu Weber shares in his book titled Infinite Impact. There was a man, William Lokovich. He was born in Boston in 1961, long after his family had fled Czechoslovakia to escape the chaos of World War II. Forty years later, an entire generation in 1989, while watching television, William realized he was seeing history unfold before his eyes. Europe was unraveling, and kudos to President Ronald Reagan, the Cold War had reached its fray and ragged end. Spellbound with wonder, William watched live news broadcasts showing East Germany refugees jumping into West Germany in, in embassy in the Czech capital of Prague. Two new nations, the Czech Republic and Slavo Slovakia, were in the birthing process right before his eyes. William, William's past called to him. He made a decision to go back to che Czechoslovakia. He said, we didn't know what, we, what was going to happen, but we wanted to be part of whatever the changes were. What appears to be a rather innocent start to this adventure seems pretty quaint now and almost too good to be true. The changes that have occurred since the Velvet Revolution in the Czech Republic have been monumental. And one of the biggest of those changes would affect the rest of William's life. In the 1990s, the new Czech parliament passed several restitution laws touching on properties that had been confiscated by the communists in the aftermath of World War II. It turned out that William has some rather significant roots. It seems that the, the family name had quite a history going back at least six centuries and connecting to multiple generations of the Czech upper crust. Bottom line, William discovered to his everlasting amazement that he was royalty, a blood prince. Even so, at this point, he was only dimly aware of the implications of that discovery. He hired a lawyer to help him wade through the dusty pages of old regional records. Then there were two lawyers, and then there were more lawyers. The researchers discovered that although many of the family's assets had eroded over the years, they were still vast enough that all that hard work had paid off, big time, something like nine castles worth. The little beauty in which William and his family now reside has 100 rooms. William opened several of the castles to the public as national museums, displaying six centuries of the family's valuable art treasures and innumerable other priceless artifacts. And all this because he looked backward on the timeline. Now, you could say that it's a very good thing William looked into his past. And that led to an earthly inheritance. But as a disciple, and because of an event that happened in the past, you are heavenly royalty. You were brought into citizenship in heaven by the blood of the prince, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And looking back to a time when the Messiah walked this earth, we have some words that he spoke that concern you and me. And they are big time words of hope. And they have huge implications concerning your future. Listen to this. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I will say that William's castles do not even compare to the, what awaits us in heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 11 says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. As a believer, through the person of the Holy Spirit, you understand the mystery of the gospel that has been hidden for ages and generations. The glory of salvation, it is truly incredible. 
But there is so much more to be revealed when all is accomplished according to Scripture. For now we remember who we are and to whom we belong. And this knowledge in itself, this foundation of truth, will cause you to weather the storms of life. We need to remember that God's word is our rock, our foundation. And it tells us what is to come. That there's going to be a final and glorious restoration. It is going to happen because it will be a new kingdom with new laws of restitution. Evil will finally be done away with and the storms of life will be silenced and the sons of God will be fully restored to their rightful place in glory and splendor and everlasting joy. 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. No more lies, no more hypocrisy, no more craziness, no more pandemics. Now, I know that some of you may struggle to apprehend this because of the storm you are going through right now. But know that we have so much more to look forward to. We have hope for a future. The storms will cease. Listen to the Bible speak to you again. 2 Corinthians, Paul says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So in the light of this glorious hope for a future, let me remind you again what we are to do in the midst of the storms of life. In Lamentations, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Jesus sees you. In fact, Jesus walks with you. Jesus will speak to you and he will never forsake you. He will guide you through the storms of life because he's in the midst of them with you. Psalm 46, 1 through 3, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. We will wait and we will look up and we will see that our redemption draws nigh. May God bless you.